Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to Fibromyalgia Association Canada's monthly presentation. I am Trudy Flynn, Chair of the Board of Directors of Fibromyalgia Association Canada, or FAC, as we like to call it. And I'm going to keep my comments brief so we can get right to Dr. Lamontagne. Thank you for joining us today. If you're not a member of FAC, you can join at the link that will be added to the chat. And FAC is committed to growing our membership for our advocacy work because there is power in numbers and together we are stronger. So before we get started, I'd like to cover just a few housekeeping items. If you have any technical issues, please email webmaster at fibrocanada.ca or just tag Mario in the chat. Uh, Mario is the vice chair of FAC. He's our webmaster and he's chair of the education committee. If you have any questions for Dr. Lamontang, please put them in the chat and we will get to them in the question and answer segment of the presentation. We have closed captioning enabled, so uh, you can feel free to use that. This presentation is re being recorded for those who could not attend at this time and for our YouTube channel. And the YouTube link will be also added to the chat. All participants will be muted and we ask that you also turn off your video so only the presenter will be in the video. Okay, so let's get started. I would like to say, start by saying that all people, although people attending may be spread across Canada, I am located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq first signed with the British Crown in 1726. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. In Nova Scotia, we are all treaty people. As part of this acknowledgement, I also recognize the history's contributions and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people who have been here for over 400 years. I recognize that without action, an acknowledgement is empty and acknowledgement marks the beginning of the work ahead of us, not the end, in fact's journey towards reconciliation. So May is Fibromyalgia Awareness Month, and FAC thought it would be good to have this month's presentation focus on juvenile fibromyalgia. Juvenile fibromyalgia is far more prevalent than many realize, and it's heartbreaking how often it goes undiagnosed, undiagnosed leaving kids and teens struggling with chronic pain and fatigue without proper support or a proper diagnosis so that they could understand why they feel so different than their peers. FAC receives many questions from parents on this topic and we often hear from members who say that they've suffered from fibromyalgia since they were a child but did not get help or diagnosis until they were in their 20s and sometimes even into their 30s. So to ensure FAC is meeting the needs of the fibromyalgia community, we have invited Dr. Christine Lamontang to talk to us about the topic of juvenile fibromyalgia. Dr. Lamontang is a pediatric anesthesiologist, a pain physician and clinical researcher at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa, popularly, popularly known as CHEO. Dr. Lamontang is the medical director of the Chronic Pain Services, where she has, the, has led the creation of an interdisciplinary chronic pain clinic. She has co-chaired the development of the Ontario Pediatric Chronic Pain Network in partnership with the Ontario Ministry of Health and continues to work at improving access to interdisciplinary chronic pain care for all children. She's developed national recognition for research in acute and chronic pain as co-investigator and collaborator on the CIHR funded strategy for patient-oriented research or SPOR, Chronic Pain Network, also called CPN. Her, 
current research focus is on identifying strategies to help improve acute pain management in order to prevent the development of chronic pain and evaluating the role of different approaches in improving pain outcomes for chronic pain patients treated in an interdisciplinary context. So thank you, Dr. Lemontang, for joining FACT today and trying to raise awareness of this often undiagnosed condition, juvenile fibromyalgia. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this uh, kind introduction. So let me share uh, my uh, slides. Okay. So, um, so what's in the name? Well, juvenile fibromyalgia. So we'll cover um, a lot today. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge, do a land acknowledgement and say that I, um, Chio is located on the tra traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. But I'd also like to acknowledge our uh, interdisciplinary colleagues who work in the chronic pain service here at Chio, who, uh, from whom I've learned so much. Um, and I've worked uh, with this fabulous team um, since 2015. And I continue also to learn from them uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we have a, a team comprised of physical therapists, psychologists, nurse practitioners, psychiatrists, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, uh, occupational therapists, recreational therapists. So quite a varied team. Um, I've also gained so much knowledge um, from my patients and from their families. Um, they have taught me so much throughout the years. I also want to thank Megan Greeno, our nurse practitioner on the acute and chronic pain service as she has uh, contributed to the slide deck and uh, uh, continues to be an inspiration for me. So I have no conflict to de declare. Um, okay, so... Um, so our objectives today will be sort of to understand a little bit more the terminology um, used to describe juvenile fibromyalgia or diffuse myofascial pain syndrome in children and youth. We'll also review um, the similarities uh, between adults and, and, uh, and pediatrics. Uh, fibromyalgia will describe the importance of an early intervention in the treatment of juvenile fibromyalgia and, and learn how to, where and and how to get help. So, uh, so the just to do this talk, I had to re research many different terminology for for this condition. So, juvenile fibromyalgia is one, but then there's widespread pain syndrome, the WPS, which is also widely used in chronic pain, in pediatric chronic pain. There's amplified musculoskeletal pain syndrome uh, or amplified uh, pain syndrome. Uh, there's diffuse myofascial pain syndrome that has been used. So many different terms for the same condition. So it is, it can get very confusing. Recently, um, we have the ICD-11 um, sort of redid the classification of, of, uh, of chronic pain into um, different nomenclature. And one of the, I think that the, the help from this has been that chronic pain now is considered a disease in its own right. Uh, the main definitions is chronic primary pain syndrome and versus secondary musculoskeletal pain syndromes. So primary pain syndrome would be a pain that's longer than three months, I say with significant emotional distress or functional disability that cannot be accounted for by another chronic pain condition or a medical condition. So for example, juvenile fibromyalgia would be a chronic primary pain condition. Chronic secondary musculoskeletal pain would be sort of a recurrent or persistent pain that arises from a disease process. So that's affecting either the bones, the joints, the muscles, or the soft tissue. So for instance, a chronic pain from juvenile idiopathic arthritis or systemic lupus uh, 
uh, would fall under that category. So this has been helpful in my view because it has not only simplified a little bit the nomenclature, but it also has uh, brought pain to be considered as an, ent an entity, a disease in its own right. So if we look uh, at the impact of pediatric chronic pain, which uh, is significant, uh, pain is, uh, is, is, it is pain that extends beyond the expected period of healing. So it's sort of a malfunctioning of the pain nervous system. Between four and 40% of children and youth have chronic musculoskeletal pain. So the incidence of uh, chronic pain in pediatrics is as much as, as prevalent as it is in adults. Uh, for juvenile fibromyalgia, if you look at the criteria for juvenile fibromyalgia, then some studies have shown that 1% to 6% of children met these criteria. Um, again, you know, we have to go back to the fact that um, the nomenclature is so varied on this condition that it is hard to, to define it as it, its incidence because uh, it, even in the literature, people are, to, are, are using different terms to describe these widespread pain syndromes. So what we know is that there's higher left pain levels uh, with reduced quality of life, uh, elevated anxiety. So a lot, 60% of these children will have high anxiety level and about 30% of, of, the, of these kids will also have severe depression. Um, what we've learned also from some of the literature late, uh, that is, is fairly recent is that there is a significant risk that they continue to have pain into adulthood. So before, I think the thought was like, it was like, oh, well, it's sort of like growing pains. You will, you will get better. This will resolve. But unfortunately, what we find out is that more than 80% of these children that met criteria for juvenile fibromyalgia went on to adulthood suffering still from, from uh, fibromyalgia, though 50% did not meet these criteria anymore, but it still experienced some of those symptoms. Uh, so the other component that we've realized is also is that diagnostic uncertainty is common and it does negatively impact pain recovery and engagement. And I'll go a little bit more onto that. This is some work from, um, from uh, our nurse practitioner, Megan, and also uh, Alex Neville, who, uh, Alexandra Neville, who was a um, psychology resident with, within our team and is now uh, working at Stanford in California. So she published with her team a study looking at diagnostic uncertainty in youth uh, with chronic pain and their parents. And some of the themes that came forward is that, that there is uh, a, 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 um, a function of a diagnosis. So, so um, the, having a diagnosis has a really, really profound um, impact on both children and their parents to better understand and, and have less of these catastrophizing or, or worries, worry thoughts that come with having pain on a daily basis. Um, also, what came out is if they didn't have this diagnosis, a lot of the children and, and parents reported like they, they were haunted by this thought of, of having been missed, like something was missing. People, like the medical system was failing them. There was, they were missing the diagnosis. And there was this search always for an alternate diagnosis. So multiple more tests and investigation, always trying to find what could be, what could this be? Uh, and of course, a lot of mistrust uh, in the medical system. Uh, that came uh, from all of these. Um, this was a qualitative work, so they did interviews with uh, 20 youth and their parents. So this is these were sort of the some of the the themes that that sort of came out from this study. 
So the prevalence of diagnostic uncertainty is, is, is largely unknown in terms of what's the prevalence, but we know that it is common in our uh, pain clinic. We see it often and it has uh, implication in terms of uh, the patient's uh, experience, uh, their adjustment to, to their pain, their acceptance of, of their pain condition, and their responsiveness to the to multimodal treatment also is influenced by this diagnostic uh, uncertainty. So when we can validate patients and explain a chronic pain diagnosis, we realize that patients uh, have better acceptance of their condition. I always tell patients, if you can understand your pain, you will be able to manage it much better. And you don't get caught up into this, these worries that, oh my God, what could, could this be? Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe they're missing something. So these thoughts are not helpful. And we've no, also noticed that there's lower rates of depression, depressive symptoms and pain catastrophizing. So pain catastrophizing is, is the way that we think about our pain as we awfulize this, this, this pain and we make it so that it, we can't control, we, we feel helpless with this pain. With our thought process, we know that this has an impact on our central sensitization process and can reinforce the pain pathways. So we also know that when patients know what their diagnosis is and, and understand pain, they have better functioning. They can also partake into this, this rehab process. Uh, in a more engaged manner. And they have less fear of their pain. So what are the symptoms of a uh, juvenile fibromyalgia? Personally, I don't use this term in my practice. Um, I use diffuse myofascial pain syndrome and I'll explain a little bit later why. Um, although the symptoms for me are very, they're all sort of it's all under the same umbrella and, and the treatment is, is similar. So symptoms of fibromyalgia is, uh, could be like joint pain. So patients will present with diffuse joint pain, uh, muscle ache, so uh, muscle pain, sensitivity to touch. So even this, a light touch can be painful, uh, fatigue, um, insomnia and disturbed sleep patterns, feeling not feeling rested, in the morning, irritable bowel syndrome, so lots of belly pain and, and crampy abdominal pain, poor concentration, uh, depression, and anxiety as well. We also see a lot of chronic tension headaches. Um, we see also POTS, which is uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and I'll explain a little bit better later what this is. Uh, we see also some pelvic myofascial pain syndrome that are associated with uh, diffuse pain, interstitial cystitis, chest pain, like myofascial types of chest pain. So in terms of diagnostic criteria for juvenile fibromyalgia, I found the, in 1985, there was Yunus and Massey who uh, came up with this diagnostic criteria. But again, there's nothing recent. Most of the, I think in the literature, uh, when they're using juvenile fibromyalgia, they uh, go by the latest uh, American uh, College of Rheumatology criteria, that 2010. So this one talks about generalized musculoskeletal pain in three or more sites for greater than three months and that we've ruled out any medical conditions. Of course, you need to rule out any like SLE or systemic lupus, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, celiac, thyroid issues, Lyme disease. These are all things that need to be done uh, prior to making a diagnosis of, of diffuse myofascial pain or, or, or fibromyalgia, juvenile fibromyalgia. Here they, uh, they mentioned some of the points, but they went, like they said, five or more typical tender points. So they realized that in children, it and I think it is the same in adults, it waxes and wanes. Some days you may have more of these points, some less, um, and that the presence uh, of 
of the of these tender points is not necessarily needed to have a diagnosis of uh, diffuse myofascial pain syndrome because of this waxing and waning feature. But the presence of these minor criteria is important uh, because they also impact on functioning. So chronic anxiety or tension, muscle tension, because this is going to affect your muscle tension, fatigue, uh, poor sleep, uh, chronic headache, irritable bowel syndrome, sub subjective soft tissue swelling. So the patients will report that they feel like it's swollen, but when you're examining, you see that there is no swelling, but it is a report, this is how they feel. Uh, numbness, so sometimes they may have altered sensation and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, why. Uh, pain is modulated by physical activity. Um, so the more they exercise, the worse their, their muscle pain gets or their joint pain gets. Uh, pain is modulated by weather factors. So if it's cold, they will feel it more. And of course, anxiety and stress. If they feel more stressed, let's say they have a big exam at school or something stressful is happening at school, they're going to feel it. They're going to feel their pain much more. Um, so in terms of, I, I it's kind of divided into precipitating factors and risk factors, because in my view, they're kind of a little bit different. Um, so precipitating factors uh, are, in my view, like what kind of initiated this cascade of pain. So uh, a lot in my practice, what I see is, is a lot of, of post-viral infections. So similar to COVID, many viruses will cause diffuse myofascial pain syndromes. So influenza, mononucleosis, parainfluenza, there's many virus, but a lot of these kids will um, say that they've gotten really sick with a virus, like fever, they were in bed for a few days. And then after that, they sort of never kind of recuperated from this. Like they, they always had this pain in their muscles and feeling tired and difficulty concentrating similar to what we've learned with long COVID. The other category of patients that we see also is the joint hypermobility. So most of these patients will meet criteria for, um, will won't meet criteria for hypermobile EDS or type three, but will have sort of benign joint hypermobility. Um, and there's also some a subset that will have sort of this positive ANA and um, they will be followed maybe by rheumatology for a while and maybe later on will develop lupus. So we do have to always think like, could this be a secondary pain syndrome versus a primary pain syndrome? Uh, in the literature also, we can find some information on small fiber neuropathy, which is a condition that mimics um, uh, juvenile fibromyalgia and can explain some of this diffuse pain. It, pain is a neuropathy of the small unmyelinated fibers, so the C, the pain nervous fibers, so the, the C fibers and the A delta fibers. Um, and they're difficult to diagnose only by um, biopsy, and even then it is difficult to diagnose, so we don't have great way to diagnose these small fiber neuropathies, but they do present themselves very similarly to um, these, these pain syndromes. And we have uh, connective tissue diseases like Marfan, EDS, uh, those DIT syndromes that will also present with diffuse pain, fatigue, all these, the same presentation as, as, uh, as a juvenile fibromyalgia. We have genetic syndromes like Noonan syndromes that have different genetic syndromes that have associated pain. So a lot, there's definitely a genetic factor uh, that's at play for juvenile fibromyalgia. A lot, I would say most of the kids that in my practice that meet criteria for juvenile fibromyalgia, they have one of their parents that have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. So we know that some genes have been identified. There's the uh, polymorphism in the serotonin transporter gene, and there's polymorphism uh, in the gene encoding for the COMT. So, but more work is needed to kind of better understand how genetics 
uh, influences these this onset of of, of uh, and progression of fibromyalgia. Female sex definitely. Uh, most patients with juvenile fibromyalgia in my practice are female between the age of thirteen to fifteen, and that's what consistent also with what's in the literature. Uh, we know that progesterone is a is a pro nociceptive, meaning it it induces pain. So some of the female hormones have been associated with more pain, but we still don't know why. Why do uh, girls get more pain, chronic pain than boys? Uh, other risk factors for central sensitization that are are to be considered is that. Uh, pain catastrophizing, so the way that we we think about our pain, um, post traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, stress in general can influence the, the central sensitization process and and induce these um, these pain this uh, pain diffuse pain syndromes. So let's talk a little bit about post infection pain syndrome because I think this is quite common in pediatrics and often the source of, of this juvenile fibromyalgia picture. Um, we know that 10 to 36% of kids that are exposed to a bacterial or viral or parasitic uh, gastroenteritis will develop irritable bowel syndrome picture. So we know that these, uh, these post-infectious inflammatory state will give these pain syndromes. Uh, long COVID in children, uh, they, the, there was a systematic review that mentioned between 1.6 to 70%, but again, you know, we need more data. This is new. Um, there's high variation in time from the infection to the numbers of, of symptoms that have been reported between four to 12 weeks. Um, definitely, we see a lot of neurocognitive dysfunction, so brain fog, depression, anxiety, um, which is present both in seropositive and seronegative children. Um, and again, prevalence of age between the teens, female sex, uh, often associated with allergic diseases or chronic conditions, obesity, um, and also other uh, risk factors. Um, in adult post-COVID syndrome, the prevalence is between 10 to 35 percent. Uh, but again, I think this, this definition of long COVID syndrome is also an issue in the literature because there's no agreement on, on a proper definition. So what is what could be causing this these post-viral pain syndrome? Uh, we know there's a prolonged inflammatory state. So the cytokines, the IL-4, 6, the IgG are elevated in, in long COVID. Um, we also know that COVID penetrates the brain through the olfactory nerve and affects cognition, memory, executive functioning. Um, they have found some protein markers of neuronal dysfunction, like amyloid beta, neurofilament, light chain. So there is some markers that are elevated in long COVID with that have neurological and cognitive complaints. So some studies are ongoing with this because COVID, as I said earlier, has is, 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 is been devastating. But the positive from COVID is that we have realized that it can produce these, these long uh, chronic pain syndromes that are associated with, um, with autonomic dysfunction and with varied uh, other symptoms. So it is important when we see these patients is of course, is to rule out any uh, secondary uh, disease process, so we want to make sure that they've been seen, if it's an IBS we, that they didn't see by GI, if it's rheumatology that have been seen by, uh, that they've had a proper rheumatological workup to rule out any autoimmune or inflammatory conditions. So ESR, rheumatoid factors, CRP, ANA, C3, so we want to have all of this blood work done. Want to rule out celiac disease. I've had one little boy, I still remember, he was referred to our program with diffuse pain. And then the I asked the 
primary care physician to do a TTG, um, which is to rule out celiac as a blood test to see if you have antibodies against gluten. And it came back positive, like very positive. So he went on to gluten-free diet and I didn't have to see him anymore because the pain resolved. I mean, this is a best case scenario, but um, it is important, it's just to state it is important to rule out these, these uh, disease process. So Lyme disease is another one um, that is getting more prevalent and needs to be ruled out um, and thyroid dysfunction. So I think that also once you get to the chronic pain clinic, it is important to kind of close the page on these investigations. They should be done first. And so that time and energy can be really focused on rehabilitation. So this is just some examples of pulse viral pain syndrome that would meet like criteria for juvenile fibromyalgia that I've seen in my practice. Uh, so 13 year old female, she's one year post Giardia parasitic GI infection uh, with severe IBS, uh, pain, dizziness, fatigue. She has pain everywhere, myalgia, brain fog, anxiety. 16 year old, 18 months, post mononucleosis infection with migratory diffuse pain in the joints, muscles, dizziness, brain fog, anxiety, depression, and, and finally a diagnosis of POTS. 12 year old had an influenza-like illness and then she developed these symptoms of viral labyrinthitis, ongoing symptoms of vertigo, ear pain, headaches, diffuse joint pain, diffuse muscle pain, uh, fatigue, dizziness. So another one, 16-year-old post-influenza, again, diffuse myalgia, chronic headaches, brain fog, anxiety, somatization, depression. This one has some functional neurological symptom disorder that uh, later on appeared and can coexist with, um, with these pain syndromes. 14-year-old uh, male post-COVID uh, with diffuse arthralgia, myalgia, fatigue, brain fog, dizziness, dizziness anxiety, and depression. So as you can see, um, these would uh, meet all of the criteria for, for juvenile fibromyalgia. So I use uh, this, um, this drawing to explain pain to my patients, to explain what is central sensitization. I think it's very important to understand it. So it's important to realize that, that pain is, is not just a physical phenomenon, it is an emotional phenomenon. In the way that the pain signal, as we see in red, uh, starts in the periphery here uh, in the shoulder in this, uh, in this drawing and goes to the spinal cord where it connects to another nerve, that's called our pain gate. So this, this is where we refer to as the pain gate. And then the pain nerve goes to the, to, the, to the brain and connects to all these different areas in the brain that are really our emotional centers. So the way that we're connected with pain is, is through our emotional centers. So um, our beliefs around pain uh, do influence our experience of pain. And our prior also experience of pain have a direct influence on, on pain, our pain experience. So we know that the pain system can be primed early on. So if we're exposed to pain very early on in our lives as young children or neonates, uh, we have more propensity to develop pain later on because the system is primed. We also know that anxiety, worry, depression, will increase pain by sort of decreasing the effectiveness of these descending inhibitions. So these blue nerves that come down from the brain, they're blue on, on the drawing here. These nerves are very important. They tend to kind of shut down the pain signal. So they come down from your brain to your pain gate and they're supposed to stop that pain from, from continuing. But we know that these are highly dependent on your emotions. So if you have anxiety, depression, where you have less serotonin, um, we know that these nerves don't work as well. So therefore, leaving this pain signal free reign to just keep propagating itself and reaching the brain. 
So distraction, relaxation, um, positive thoughts around the pain can really help to close that pain gate um, and decrease the pain. So, and this is where the inclusion of psychological uh, therapies and pain management is so important. And here there's a, is a link for a, a little video to explain pain and, and then um, sort of a little bit differently than I did today, but uh, you, you're welcome to uh, access this video if you want. So if we look at the chronic pain spiral, um, we know that there's different risk factors. Every pain starts with an acute pain process. So most of the time we can relate to something that started it. Um, so is it an infection, something, maybe we overdid it one day, um, we're sore. Uh, and then what, what happens so that it, this becomes sort of a chronic phenomenon? Uh, we know there, there's probably genetic predisposition that we are starting to understand. There's some uh, hormonal factors. We know women are more prone to it. So probably hormones have to play uh, a certain role in this. Um, and there's this whole nerve central sensitization process that happens in the brain. Some, some seem to be more at risk of this. Um, and the intensity of the acute pain process seems also to be uh, one of the factors. And as I said, the way that we uh, conceptualize our pain is so important. So also the, the coping around the pain is important. So when we do perceive tissue damage, we, went, we go to sort of a, a passive coping mechanism where we kind of limit our activities. Uh, but sometimes this can be too much. We can um, rest even too much and then get weaker and tighter muscles. If we isolate ourselves and, and migrate to our beds, um, then we get you know physical and psychosocial, psychosocial deconditioning. We withdraw from our social life, our physical life, and then we get an increase in our anxiety, the depression, the anger. And really we get into that, what we call the pain-centered life. So we want to change this chronic pain spiral by sort of accepting that this pain is, uh, is there, but it's not dangerous uh, because we're going to understand our pain better. Um, so education is super important. Having some analgesia being validated in our experience of pain is super important. So this is where validation, diagnostic, and cert, like, getting rid of this diagnostic uncertainty is so important. Um, and then developing these active coping styles where we learn some self-management skills to slowly increase our activity in a paced fashion, so small baby step, and go to physical reconditioning and prove our social functioning that way. And then we get you know into this more function-centered life where our anxiety and depression and anger and sleep is going to be improved. So that brings me to my next topic, is the myofascial system. Um, so these uh, conditions involve the myofascial system, and it is a forgotten organ in, uh, in medicine. We don't talk about the fascia much. I've never heard about fascia ever in my medical school years. Um, so what is fascia? Fascia is the connective tissue layer that is present over all our muscles, organs, brain, joints, and bones. It, it, it is the matrix to which supports and connects the entire body. It transports and absorbs mechanical energy. It is very innervated. It's got uh, lots of blood vessels and all the little painters kind of weave themselves through that fascial system. Like I say to the kids, I said, it's like you have a Spider-Man suit under your skin that's over your muscle and all of your little painters are in that suit. And that fascia will hold memory. It will hold memory of, of, of different posture, maybe bad postures that we have, stress, uh, physical and psychological trauma. Uh, dehydration will affect our myofascial system and aging as well. So here we have a picture of the fascial system over the muscles uh, of and we can see all the blood vessels running through it. And this is a microscopic uh, picture of, of, uh, the fa of fascia. 
So if you look at the fascial system, it is quite fascinating because there's these bands of fascia that are in our body. And if you look at these bands, they really correlate very well to these acupuncture meridians. So what the Chinese medicine knowledge. So the Chinese knew about the fascial system in a way that we didn't even know. Uh, so a lot of the therapies um, based at, at aimed at the at addressing fascial um, myofascial restraints or myofascial tightness uh, include things like acupuncture, uh, shiatsu massage, yin yoga, qigong. These are all very old traditional uh, ways to deal with pain, but really what they target is is your myofascial system. Nowadays, we talk about myofascial release or MFR, which a lot of um, either massage therapists or physiotherapists or osteopaths have training in. And, and the results can be excellent if you have a good um, myofascial therapist that can really help uh, with these, this diffuse myofascial pain syndromes. Well, we know also about the myofascial pain, uh, myofascial uh, system is that if you improve your hydration, so if you drink lots of water during your day, you will, it will help that fascia sort of slide over the muscles. So this fascial system is supposed to have this nice sliding over the muscles. But what happens is then when we have surgery, we have an, a, a certain trauma, or maybe it's an infection, something happens in our bodies, that fascia kind of gets stuck and it doesn't have that nice flowing uh, sliding motion over our muscles. And when it gets stuck, it does these knots where all the pain fibers are getting a little irritated and sending that signal of pain. So also we know that folic acid, B12, and magnesium can really help uh, the myofascial system, which I usually include this in my uh, therapy, which I'll, um, I'll talk about a little bit later. So if we look at the myofascial band here on the, on the, in the blue, uh, on the picture, and the one on the right connecting with organs, and if you look uh, at acupuncture uh, meridians, um, you will see that they're very close. And these uh, so-called uh, myofascial points are also all on these uh, bands of myofascial tissues. So for me, fibromyalgia or diffuse myofascial pain syndrome, as I like to call them, is, is like a diffuse myofascial pain plus a central sensitization process with or without autonomic dysfunction. So what does that mean? It's like the dysfunction of the autonomic system. So because our pain nervous system and our autonomic system, so our fight or flight system, uh, runs side by side, when one becomes dysregulated or malfunctioning, the other one often joins the ball because of that proximity of the way that we're wired. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about autonomic dysfunction towards the end in the forms of POTS, our postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So how do we approach these? So all of these pain syndromes um, that have so many different names, but really uh, are probably the same um, pathophysiology uh, is, is best with this what we call the, the 5P approach at GEO. So 5Ps um, are so pharmacology, uh, physical strategies, psycholo psychological strategies, um, and you have this the patient in the middle who's doing this self-management, who's incorporating these all these and learning and all these different ways to manage their pain. And we've added parenting and pacing because we felt like this also was was very important. So parents are very important in pediatrics. They act as coach. So we need to teach them how to be good coaches for their for their youth. Uh, and we they need also to learn the same thing as the youth are, are learning. 
uh, and pacing. Pacing is so important because if you overdo it, if you're doing really well one day, you want to do it all, then the next day you're really sore and you can't move and you set yourself back. So you're doing what I call the up and down roller coaster, um, which is not good for the pain myofascial system. What's better is a paced approach with uh, a slow, steady progression. So let's talk a little bit about some of the pharmacological approach that um, we can use for uh, juvenile fibromyalgia or diffuse myofascial pain syndrome. So we use in our clinic a lot of magnesium because I think it targets the myofascial system and I call it the bowel protocol and I'm happy to, uh, to share this with you. So it really pushes up the magnesium uh, supplementation uh, to, the, to the point where there's a loose stool and then you back up on your uh, magnesium level. So magnesium is a, will help and it also helps with bowel motility. So this is something that we use and we've had good, good success. There's also some cream, some topicals that you can have, like you can have made. So some uh, compound cream with magnesium that we use, and I've had great success with myofascial pain. Vitamin D is to be supplemented. Low levels are been associated with juvenile fibromyalgia or, or these diffuse pain syndromes. They're not, we don't think they're causative. Uh, though we, we're not sure, but we, we see that there's an association. So I tend to correct this. Everybody should be on vitamin D anyways, uh, because especially in Canada, we don't have enough exposure to uh, sunlight. Iron levels is a good thing to check. Um, uh, can be associated with low levels, can be associated with dizziness and fatigue, and uh, should be corrected if, if it's low. Other uh, medication that can be used uh, to target the, the central sensitization is the pregabalin and gabapentin. They act at that pain gate uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, the tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline or triptyline can help with sleep and also target the, the central sensitization process. Other medication that we use are the SNRI or the serotonin neuropnephrine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like duloxetine that can stimulate the descending inhibitory pathways and help uh, also co-treat anxiety and depression. Tramadol is a mixed opioid and uh, sort of SNRI action that can be used sort of targeted maybe for uh, periods of maybe acute or chronic pain, uh, maybe around overdoing it or physio or anything, any pain, something that's that's more concrete in time where there's acute pain flare over of a chronic uh, condition. Muscle relaxants also can be very useful for myofascial pain in the short term uh, to um, be able to partake in, in some physical activity. So baclofen or cyclobenzaprine, although they all have some side effects, all of these medi medication can have uh, some side effects. So they have to be, uh, that have to be weighted in uh, with the increase in functioning. So topical creams that we use are magnesium chloride, 10%, the diclofenac 2 to 10%, all the mental-based over-the-counter uh, creams also are, uh, if they provide relief, uh, can be recommended safely. Uh, treatment, uh, as indicated for insomnia, um, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, anxiety, and POTS has to be uh, depending on, on, uh, on the presentation. Uh, there's not much benefit to uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, naproxen, celecoxib when they're used alone, but sometimes they may confer some benefit if they're added to, uh, to other medication. The, the, there's no really benefit to long-term opioids with juvenile fibromyalgia. Uh, again, you know, it can be targeted with short uh, course if it's a, more of an acute on chronic uh, presentation than for increasing functioning, but there's really uh, no benefit to long-term opioids in this population. Um, so we have to be realistic goals with medication and intervention. As I say to my patients, like 
this is really a third of your pie, like it, it is going to do just one third of it too. So we can expect maybe 30 to 50 percent pain reduction with meds. Uh, total pain relief is completely unrealistic goal. So the ideal is to improve the functioning while minimizing the side effects and um, eventually will reduce this, the improvement functioning will eventually reduce pain, which is a hard concept to grasp when you're dealing with pain on a daily basis and perhaps for a very long time. But as the blood flow increases to the myofascial system, um, the um, healing process will occur and pain will start decreasing. So we have really to fun to to center ourselves on, on, on functioning and pain relief as a secondary uh, goal while minimizing side effects, of course. Uh, we want to always minimize side effects. Anything that decreases functioning should not uh, be prescribed. Um, in terms of psychological approach for these diffuse myofascial pain syndrome, uh, we have uh, cognitive behavior therapy either in individual or group sessions. Um, we focus on relaxation-based treatment, distraction, uh, activity, pacing, um, problem solving, uh, replacing negative uh, sort of catastrophic thoughts around the pain to more calming and realistic ones, to more positive ones, uh, working on acceptance of the pain through com acceptance commitment therapy, we also have groups in our program uh, with dialectic behavior therapy. So especially for these youth that have a lot of emotions, so for emotional regulation, we can, which can be uh, really helpful. We have uh, helpful. We have these uh, group sessions with both parents and youth. Uh, so parent coaching, as I said, is super important in all this uh, because they uh, can continue the work at home and they can also alter the family dynamics in a way that, that is more um, conducive to healing. Uh, so treating underlying mental health conditions, so depression, anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress disorders is also uh, very important. Uh, and attending to the stress. So what is the stress or the how does the, if the child feels unsafe in the environment, or uh, stressed by something. Uh, it could be at home, at school, with friends, but helping uh, with this can uh, also have a huge impact on uh, the pain and the central sensitization process. So also evaluating uh, youth for learning disorders, ADHD, because lots of school stress in these cases can have a profound impact on myofascial tension and, and promotion of these myofascial pain syndromes. So these are some of the recommended readings that uh, we, um, we recommend that for our, our teens and, and parents at the, the first appointment. So we have the Chronic Pain and Illness Workbook for Teens. It's a, it's a workbook that you can get on Amazon for about 20 something dollars. Uh, it's CBT mindfulness-based practice to turn the volume down on pain. There's, this is from Rachel Zofnes. She's a pain psychologist in the uh, U.S. And she has a great um, website, also www.zofnes.com. Lots of information from parents, healthcare providers, and uh, parents, uh, parents, healthcare providers, and patients. And then for parents, we have these two books, When Your Child Hurts, uh, Effective Strategies to Increase Comfort and Reduce Stress and Break the Cycle of Chronic Pain by Rachel Coakley, and also uh, Breaking Free of Child Anxiety and OCD, the Ellie uh, Lebovitz uh, book, which is also very good if, if uh, you have a child dealing with a lot of anxiety. We have uh, helpful apps uh, that we recommend. Uh, so these are more mindfulness-based apps, but they can also help with pain because they help to reduce that body tension decrease the stress on the myofascial system and help the, the healing of the myofascial system. So mind shift, headspace and, a headspace and smiling mind um, are available on the app store. So physical approaches to treat uh, these diffuse pain sy syndrome are super important. So exercise is, medicine, is the medicine here. Uh, as I say, you want to have more active than passive physical strategies. 
um, and pacing, 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 pacing. I like the story about the rabbit and the turtle, the La Fontaine, the uh, famous fable, um, and you want to be the turtle. You want to be the troll. It's, it, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, and I keep telling that to the teenagers because, of course, they want to go, go, go. They have, they really want to go back to their physical activities. They want to do so much, um, but they have to be patient in order to do this in a paced approach. So not to set themselves back. Um, so a graded aerobic exercise program as the best evidence uh, for um, healing. It brings, because when you do an aerobic exercise, you increase your blood flow, you increase more blood flow to the, to the myofascial system and you help with healing and more of the, the sliding of that fascia and the strengthening and joint around also joint stability, especially if there's hypermobility, this is going to be important. Stretching, stretching of the myofascial system, and this mind-body connection, any exercise where there's an exercise and mind-body connection at the same time will have the best yield. So sort of like, yeah, like your yin or your restorative yoga where you have deep breathing, uh, qigong, tai chi, because all of these exercises combine deep breathing. So when you're deep breathing, you're doing your diaphragmatic breathing, you are stimulating your parasympathetic system as well as as, as attending to your myofascial system. So you're targeting the system in two, in the autonomic system and the myofascial system, which is the best way to go. Um, in terms of um, research, we have a group in Cincinnati um, that are doing, they're called the Fibromyalgia Integrative Training for Teens or FIT. Uh, program at Cincinnati Children, and they have uh, they have an active program where they're combining cognitive behavior therapy with neuromuscular exercise program, and they've shown very good results. As opposed to they had a randomized control trial, sort of with one group having this combination of therapy versus just having CBT uh, or exercise and. When you combine both of these together, you have the best, like they have the best uh, results. So in terms of physical strategy, this is on the right. The picture is the, the pool at Holland Blurview Rehabilitation Center, which in Ontario is our um, intensive uh, pain rehabilitation center. Um, so Typically, uh, patients would start in an outpatient program, chronic pain program. So most of the chronic pain clinics, the pediatric chronic pain clinics would offer uh, this component of, of this 3P or 5P approach. Um, but if it's more is needed either, if uh, more disability is present or a patient is not responding to uh, the outpatient um, intervention, then the next step up is to go to an inpatient intensive rehabilitation program similar to what we have at Holland Blurview. So the definition of these programs are that they need to have uh, sort of a pain medicine um, specialist present, uh, physio, therapy uh, and psychology and combine these these all of these approaches these this 3p or 5p approach together an intensive program where uh, the patients get this for at least eight hours a day um, in an intensive fashion either as outpatient or inpatient so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Ontario Pediatric Chronic Pain Network. So I partnered with the uh, ministry in 2012, 2013 uh, with Dr. Fiona Campbell from SickKids. And we helped develop uh, this um, chronic pain network across the province. So um, we have our clinic here at CHEO. There's one in Toronto. We help London and McMaster uh, create, like start their own chronic pain clinic. Um, and then we decided that we needed this in more intensive level of uh, intervention for these uh, children that had more disability or more needs. So we created the Holland Blurview Pain Rehab uh, Get Up and Go. Uh, and these were all funded by the ministry through this uh, uh, this network-based funding. 
And Thunder Bay now has also added a pilot project um, with uh, teens um, looking at chronic pain management. So this is a little bit of program overview of our, our CHEOS chronic pain service. So patients get referred, they go through an orientation process where they get uh, validated, their pain gets validated, they get some pain education and they get a little bit of pre-screening done. Then they have their initial assessment which it, it is done in a, an interdisciplinary fashion with um, myself present, uh, physiotherapy, psychology or psychiatry, pharmacy. And then the second part is the goal setting. So we do use a COPM or the Canadian Occupational uh, Index um, goal setting or where the patients will um, make some goals about what they would like to achieve um, in the future or presently if they're not able, to, if they want to go back to sports, if they just want to walk, or it could be any of the goals, good, attending school, having more friends. So they make these goals. And then with these goals, we work with the youth uh, through a combination of, of, of group sessions and individual sessions uh, with our LR team to, to reach these goals. If we see that the youth is not, is not getting better, then we, can ref we do refer out to uh, Holland Blurview Intensive Rehabilitation Program. And after that, they get referred back to us to continue sometimes some of the rehabilitation work. And once they are functioning well, then they, they can, and they feel like they, they can manage their pain, then they can be discharged. So this is our, our sort of a program. This is the Power Over Pain portal, which is a new portal. Um, it's a Canada-wide portal. Uh, there's a youth component, an adult component, and the youth uh, has just started, but there's lots of resources to help uh, sort of learn more about chronic pain and how to manage uh, chronic pain. And there's webinars, there's lots uh, available. These are additional virtual resources that we give patients. So the Tap Me web, pain website also, although for adults, has a lot of uh, self-management strategies and psychoeducational modules on chronic pain. Uh, My Care Path from BC Children <clears throat> has a lot also of uh, videos and, and self-guided learning experience for, around pain. Anxiety Canada also has lots uh, of uh, resources uh, to manage anxiety, but they, they have a, a youth and an adult portal and that can help with, uh, with pain management. And the other ones are more local um, resources around uh, the Ottawa, Pembroke uh, and Oxbury area. These are additional resources, the web map mobile app also, I know that a lot of the youth love um, apps. So this is a good one also to help with pain management. The pain toolkit, um, we have super stretch um, that can help with, um, with movement and relaxation to stop, breathe and think. And I also I recommend the Yoga with Adrian, um, which is a YouTube, which has a great YouTube channels for, uh, for kids. So I just wanted to briefly talk about POTS and what it is. So often uh, that is associated with uh, juvenile fibromyalgia and post-viral pain syndrome. It is a dysfunction of the, of the autonomic uh, nervous system and manifests itself with uh, sort of orthostatic tachycardia. So basically when they stand up, they get their heart rate gets really high. So in adults, if you go from lying position to standing and your heart rate gets increase by more than 30 beats per minute, you meet the criteria. In youth, it's 40 beats per minute from uh, age zero to 19. Uh, typically, they used to do this head up tilt table test, but now you can probably do it with just um, measurements of vitals, uh, uh, lying down and standing after one, two, three, and up to five minutes and over 10 minute period, five to 10 minute period and, and with two different readings. Um, sometimes you'll have some changes in the blood pressure, but it should be minimal, like uh, no less than like 20 over 10, like systolic of 20 and 10 of, of uh, diastolic. And um, 
we what we know about this syndrome is that there seems to be some sympathetic activation. So sometimes you'll have some elevated plasma norepinephrine level. These patients tend to uh, report that they're um, better when they're lying down and they're worse when they're up. Um, I mean, it's important to rule out uh, that that they're not dehydrated, that they don't have uh, an, an endocrine uh, abnormality, anemia, or any other medications that, that could produce this, because some other pain medicine medication that we use can also uh, give uh, postural symptoms. It is estimated as about 0.2% of the U.S. population has POTS, but the prevalence in pediatric is, is actually unknown. But it's certainly a, a syndrome that I see often associated with these diffuse uh, pain syndrome, especially the post-viral uh, or post-infections uh, category. So in terms of cardiac, they'll have rapid heart rate, so uh, at rest and with um, orthostatic changes. So if they, they then when they stand up, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, syncope, uh, they have there have exercise intolerance and deconditioning. So when they're trying to exercise, their heart rate shoots up and they feel fairly unwell. They also report some palpitations. Um, Non-cardiac, they'll have brain fog, chronic headaches, nausea, tremulousness, fatigue, insomnia, and what we call POTS feet, which is a peripheral acrocyanosis. So we can see the picture there on the corner. Uh, there it's like the the feet get kind of blue, reddish, um, which is associated with POTS, and they often complain of IBS symptoms. So these is just other pictures of what um, POTS can look like, especially when they get out of, from the shower or if they go in the shower and then when they get out, they notice uh, their legs changing colors. So we don't really fully understand what's causing this this POTS, but we know that it's a dysfunction of the autonomic system. Um, and it can be seen with hypermobile ADS, post-viral syndrome, chronic fatigue syndromes, autoimmune disorders, mast cell activation disorders, celiac. Uh, so when they stand up, basically the blood vessels, instead of vasoconstricting, uh, they kind of vasodilated, so there's pooling of blood in the, uh, in the lower extremities, and the heart rate then uh, beats faster. So that is a sort of a sort of a very broad way of, of explaining it. Uh, obviously, it's a little more complex than this, but it's some of the symptoms that uh, are uh, from from this phenomenon. So the Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, has come up with some uh, position statement on a POTS uh, with some uh, recommending some, some therapies. And here in town, we have a cardiologist that we who follows these patients and can initiate some of these medications. Some of them are beta blockers, um, like evabradine uh, or uh, fludrocortisone uh, that can help um, with some of the symptoms. But the, the initial is to increase the hydration, so they have to aim for three to four liters per day of, of, of fluid, increase salt up to 10 grams uh, per day, which is significant. So often I prescribe little salt tablets because it's hard to um, have so much salt in one's diet. And uh, the uh, compression garments, so compression garments of the lower leg can help also. Uh, and of course, um, withdrawal of any culprit, so if there's meds uh, ca causing this. So in summary, um, I think it's important to validate the pain experience of children and teens. Um, they are so often dismissed because there's no medical diagnosis to explain their pain. And chronic pain syndromes are diseases of their own right. As we know with the ICD-11 classification, uh, it's now said this is a condition. Um, so sometimes getting hooked up on too many names can be counterproductive, um, especially um, when it, it's a matter of, of, of research or, or moving forward with treatments. Uh, so understanding and being able to explain central sensitization and the myofascial system, I think is, is so important. 
uh, this is the diagnosis is the central sensitization process. So um, I would say that um, diffuse myofascial pain syndrome have to be treated with this integrative uh, 3P approach, so combination of pharmacological, active physical, and psychological approaches that target the myofascial system and the mind-body connection. We have to be mindful also to treat associated condition like depression, which is prevalent in this population up to 30% and anxiety up to 60%. And we have a lot of undiagnosed learning disorders that are leading to more anxiety and that also need to be addressed and POTS, uh, which is prevalent uh, with this population. So early intervention is key to avoid persistent disability because we know that these kids um, it's not just growing pains. This, these can go into adulthood and, and have persistent pain and disability. So outpatient and inpatient pain rehabilitation that combine neuromuscular exercise and this cognitive behavior therapy approach, the psychological minded approach seems very promising to uh, reduce disability and reduce pain. So I welcome any questions or feedback. And this is my email if you need to contact me. I'm silamontagne at uh, chio.on.ca. And um, on X, I'm at Doc Christine L. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamontagne. That was excellent. Uh, I had a list of six questions that you totally answered them all. So oh, good. Very good presentation. It was. It's excellent. And um, as a person who had a daughter with fibromyalgia, and I now have a grandson, it, it was wonderful because you did hit on all the points that someone like me, a parent or a grandparent, uh, would be interested in. Having said that, we do have questions in the chat. Uh -huh. uh, we, have, we have one from Janice who asks, what is the youngest age that fibromyalgia presents uh, that's not growing pains? I've had them as early as six years old. So um, especially with these very hypermobile sort of uh, conditions, it can start fairly early. Sometimes it will, I, in my experience, especially in the younger population, it will start in their lower extremities. So they will start, complain more about lower extremity uh, pain. And then it, as they get older, it's sort of, more general, it becomes more generalized. Oh, okay, that's interesting and uh, important to know, I think, as a parent. So uh, Mario asked that you mentioned that most patients are female with juvenile fibromyalgia, and that's the case with adults as well. So his question is, um, is it because male youths are being dismissed as adult men are? It's very difficult as an adult male to get diagnosed with fibromyalgia because it's seen as a woman's disease, or it's just that we don't like, doctors don't like to label, label men with uh, conditions like fibromyalgia. Um, and men tend to play down their chronic pain, I think, and they're little less than honest with their doctors sometimes. So if, is that true with children as well? Possibly, possibly it is uh, sort of more of a cultural phenomenon that, you know, we expect boys to kind of suck it up and, you know, you just keep going even if you have pain and it's more like, don't complain about it. It's not something that men do. Uh, maybe that old sort of thinking is, is part of this. Um, but definitely, I think there's definitely a hormonal factor, though, uh, definitely, because if we look, uh, definitely girls are over and girls and women are overrepresented in, uh, in, in the pain in chronic pain. Uh, and I think it has to do with with the hormones, the female hormones, because before age 13, 15, which is really when girls start having their cycles, uh, we don't see, I would say like the, the incidence men, uh, so girls and boys is probably more equal in terms of incidence of chronic pain. And then when we hit puberty, 
we see this big change. So there's definitely, in my view, there's definitely a, a, a role for uh, female hormones in promoting pain. It's interesting too. Uh, and um, it would be interesting study to see if that uh, works in the opposite direction when women go through menopause. That would be an interesting study for adult researchers. Are the 20, 2016 diagnostic criteria that we have for adults, is that um, applicable to teenagers as they get closer to adulthood? Would that be applicable or is it better to use the pediatric criteria? So again, there are a lot of debates out, out there. And if you go in the literature, chronic widespread pain syndrome as its own uh, criteria, which is basically pain in the four quadrants, like if they have to have the four quadrants, um, you know, all of this is, is good for when you're trying to do research, you want to study a more homogenous group because you're trying to make uh, to derive um, some conclusion. Uh, and so you you need groups that are more homogenous. And I think a lot of, of these criteria are really for, they're meant for research. Because in clinical practice, does it really matter? Like if you have five, three or four or seven, uh, you know, painful fibromyalgia points? No, it doesn't. I mean, you're still having... You're still struggling with pain. You're still having problem with your, with your functioning. You're still with dealing with anxiety, depression, IBS, etc. And you still need help. So, um, so I think that you know, getting too hooked up on like which one is you know, and and trying to, too much uh, terminology is not helpful. And diagnostic criteria is is not necessarily helpful here. I think having just saying this is a central sensitization process and realizing that, um, as we know, that, you know, it waxes and wanes. I mean, some days you may have like four or five of these fibromyalgia points that are tender, and then the next week you're doing better and you have zero. So does that mean that the following week you have no more fibromyalgia? Not really. It is <laughs> it is important to get a diagnosis, though, you said. Yes, and, and, but uh, I think the umbrella has to be a little bit wider, and I think it has to include, um, you know, all of diffuse myofascial uh, pain mm -hmm. syndromes. So, Okay, so you mentioned a high incidence of anxiety and depression. Do we know if that's secondary to living with fibromyalgia or if they coexist as a primary comorbidity or... That's an excellent question. So like, which comes uh, first, uh, you know, the uh, chicken or the egg? Um, you know, I think they coexist. Uh, it's, it is difficult. We know that living with pain for any amount of time will bring on more anxiety and depression for sure. Um, but we also know that anxiety temperament tend to also be more prone to central sensitization. So I think it's a, it's a bi-directional uh, relationship between pain and uh, depression and anxiety. And, and it's hard to know which one comes first. Uh, certainly, you know, anxiety is prevalent. I mean, everybody you know, has some anxiety in their lives at some point in their time. So uh, or stress, at least. Uh, so I think that, uh, that, I think that can, that most people can relate to that, but I don't have a good answer for that. Like we, we often wonder ourselves in, in the pain clinic, like did it predate the onset of pain or did it uh, occur after? And I could say from my own experience with my pain patient, as would say 50, 50, like some, it was present before, and then the pain started, some pain started, and then this came after. So I would say it's pretty much equally divided. So um, Shell asks, if a person was uh, undiagnosed youth fibromyalgia until their 40s, would that delay in diagnosing have a negative impact on their pain? Well, in the sense that the disability and the 
the, the maladaptive coping may be more difficult to unwind, but it, it's never too late to start a myofascial approach. Um, even if you've been living with this for 20 years or 25 years, um, you know, <clears throat> combining these uh, myofascial, trying to find somebody who offers um, and has a good understanding of the myofascial system and can help and then integrating like some uh, physical, some aerobic activities. Pool therapy is excellent to start with, especially if you're very sore. So there's lots of programs like where acroaerobics or things in the water where you can move and, and get your heart rate up um, that can really help with, with healing. So it's never too late to start a program, I would say. Uh, the only thing is, of course, it's having all this, these years of lost uh, productivity or, or in, and lost, uh, you know, in, in loss in terms of maybe social French friendships, uh, social uh, um, opportunities or, or studies or work or like that's that's where I see the loss. So uh, Janice also asked, are there specific fibro symptoms that are more common in youth versus adults? Are there certain, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, are there specific fibro symptoms that are more common in youth versus adults? Versus adults? Um, I think that, well, again, you know, thinking that probably the ones that get referred to the pain clinics are probably the more severe ones. Um, so I may have a, a, a you know, uh, maybe a biased uh, a view, but I think that they have usually more autonomic dysfunction than maybe in the adults. So we'll have more of that POTS symptoms where, and this IBS, like a lot of bowel issue, nausea, vomiting is, is uh, and, and bowel issues are quite uh, predominant uh, and, and headaches, a lot of chronic tension headaches. And I would say sleep is, is also a big one that affects sleep uh, tremendously. Sleep is, is a difficult one for a lot of youth. Okay. So uh, Manu says, I'm 19 years old. I got pain four years ago after a small accident. He said, I don't know, maybe COVID. Um, and only got diagnosed last year. So that's just a comment. And uh, I have a question. Can POTS come and go? So uh, one week you have a lot of episodes, um, but then for two weeks you're just fine and then it comes back? Yes. That's common? Yes. So POTS will follow a little bit the same pattern as a, as a pain condition. You'll have periods where you can, it, your system, your, your nervous system is in better shape and functioning more the right way. And then other uh, periods of time where it's, it's not, it's malfunctioning. So it's a bad week for POTS. Uh, yeah. yeah, you'll have more dizziness, more uh, symptoms. Could be also related to your hydration status, um, the amount of salt that you're getting, stress. Because again, you know, the mind-body connection, we know that, you know, all of the autonomic and pain nervous system is connected to our uh, emotional system so being mindful that if it's more there's more stress in your in your school at work uh, you're going to feel it more uh, and it's going to have an impact on on these disease processes okay so the last question is uh, I have evolved over the years from always being sick as a child then uh, juvenile arthritis mono Epstein-Barr virus CFS to fibro then differential diagnosis of lupus or Shrogan syndrome, and now POTS. My question is, do you see ambulatory wheelchair use as positive aspect? She uh, said, I'm able to walk, but find the outings exhaustive. My post-exercise post malaise is very bad, and I've been told that there is a concern of deconditioning using a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So definitely, I mean, I call them mobility aids. So a wheelchair would fall under that. It's a, it's like similar to crutches. It, it helps you. It's a crutch. It, it helps you to get through a certain part of your day. 
but you want to limit as much as possible the crutch or the, the the wheelchair because of course the more that we're sitting with these or, or we're we're uh, we're not active with these syndromes that it may be POTS or uh, diffuse pain syndrome is the more that we can decondition and the way out of of all of this is really we're slow steady progressive you know uh, discontinuation of of the of the mobility aid to get a little bit more functional. So it's not an overnight, it's not an all or none thing where we like all of a sudden, okay, I'm leaving my, my wheelchair there and I'm doing everything, but it's just going very slowly, like adding an hour less on the wheelchair and then getting more into physical activity. But you know, it's understandable when you have so much energy to do to do your day that you want to conserve some of that energy. So it can be used in a in a in a good way. Uh, to conserve energy, but then has to be um, slowly sort of uh, the, the the length of time has to be slowly decreased within uh, a rehab uh, program. Okay. Thank you very much. So that ends our question period. So thank you so much, Dr. Lamontang. It's uh, wonderful work that you do. Uh, it's uh, okay. always good to help children so that they don't uh, become chronic adult mm -hmm. conditions. So uh, it is a wonderful thing you do. So, and then we fact really appreciates you doing this. This is Fibromyalgia Awareness Month. So it's appropriate that we uh, try to raise awareness on this uh, mm -hmm. kind of difficult to get diagnosed condition. So uh, I uh, would like to express our appreciation and I will Mario and I will make sure this on, this is on YouTube quickly so that other people can benefit from this presentation as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.